In today's video, we are going to go over six different, very interesting example problems for Kepler's third law of planetary motion. Now, before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Step-by-Step Step Science. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. When I look at my YouTube analytics, I see that more than 90% of the people who watch my videos have not subscribed. Please support my channel. Subscribe, click the notifications bell, give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and don't forget to share this video. In addition to that, I've made a bunch of other teaching and learning materials, which you can find my Teachers Pay Teachers website for a variety of topics in physics. You can find notes, you can find practice problems, example problems with all the solutions, puzzles, activities that you can do with PHET Interactive Simulations. It's all there. The link is in the description below. Check it out. And now we're going to start with Kepler's third law. Please remember, Kepler's law, Kepler's third law says that the square of the planet's orbital period T is proportional to the cube of the length of the sun major axis A of its orbit. I have another video, which you can link to in the upper right-hand corner of this video, which goes over an explanation for all three of Kepler's third, all three of Kepler's laws. Okay, now, for uh, uh, we can rewrite that uh, uh, in words. We can rewrite that as t squared is proportional to a cubed. Now, there's some other ways that you will see Kepler's third law written, and this is a variety of them. We're going to use all of these equations in the six very interesting examples that we're going to do, so we're not going to spend more time going over all of those equations. Let's just get started with example number one, and that is that we want to know what is the orbital period of Mars. Okay, for the planet Mars, we want to know what is the time it takes to go once around the sun. Now, we're going to use Kepler's third law in this form, that t squared is proportional to a cubed. And because we're talking about our solar system, you can only use this way with our solar system. If the period is given in years, if the length of the seven major axis is given astronomical units, then we can rewrite this form of Kepler's third law as simply that t squared is equal to a cubed, and we can use that relationship to determine the orbital period because we want to figure out what is t in this case. Now, we're going to give the period in years, and, and we're going to find the period in years, and we're going to give the distance in astronomical units. Well, what is an astronomical unit? Well, an astronomical unit, one astronomical unit, is the distance from the Earth to the sun. Okay, that's kind of the solar system's meter stick. It's the distance from the sun to the earth, and we call that distance one astronomical unit, and that is approximately 150 million kilometers. Okay, for Mars, we can measure that the distance from the sun to Mars, its sun and major axis, is 1.5 to four astronomical units. So we know the astronomical units, so we can solve for the period just by plugging that in. So that gives us that t squared is equal to 1.524 cubed. And that gives us that t squared is equal to 3.5396. We're going to square both sides, excuse me, take the square root of both sides, and we get that the period for Mars is 1.88 Earth years. You are going to get out of this equation, either if you're looking for the period in Earth years, or if you're looking for the sine major axis, you'll get the answer in astronomical units. Our answer in this case is 1.88 Earth years, and that means that it takes 687 days for Mars to go once around the Sun, and that's, of course, Earth days. Okay, that is Example number one. In our second example, we are going to be using Kepler's third law to determine the mass of the sun. Now, this is very interesting how this works out. This is the form of Kepler's third law that we're going to use. And it says here that the sine major axis cubed divided by the period squared is equal to g, which is our gravitational constant. And this is the mass that we're going to be solving for. This is the mass of the sun. This is the mass of the central object. And that's going to be divided by 4 pi squared. Now, in this case, because we're talking about our solar system and the mass of the sun, we can use the length of the sun major axis and the orbital period for any object that is orbiting that central mass, which in this case is the sun. We could use this information, A and T, for any planet in the solar system, and you'll get the same answer for the mass of the sun. Now, for this example, we're going to use the sun major axis and the period for Earth. Earth has a sun major axis, which is 150 kilometers, 
and has a period that is 365 days. Now we're going to take this equation and solve for the mass of the sun. So what we're going to do first is we're going to do cross multiplication and we're going to cross multiply in this direction. So we get 4 pi squared times a cubed is going to be equal to t squared times g ms. And once again, this is the mass of the sun and this is what we're solving for. So we are going to divide both sides of this equation by t squared times g and we get that the mass of the sun is equal to 4 pi squared times a cubed divided by t squared times g. All right, now what we have to do is plug all the values in. We have to do one thing first, though, of course, and be careful here because you'll notice that g I wrote down here first is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meter squared kilogram squared. Well, inside these units, because a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, we have to make sure that the values that we plug in are in meters, because we have meters here, and the period has to be in seconds because a newton has a second in its unit. All right, so we are going to convert 150 million kilometers to 1.50 times 10 to 9 meters. This is 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. Well, there's 1,000 meters in a kilometer, obviously, so we got to make this 10 to the 9. And when we convert 365 days into seconds, you get 3.15 times 10 to the 7 seconds. All right, so now we can just plug those values in. 4 pi squared is 4 pi squared. Our semi-major axis is 150 times 10 to the 9 meters cubed. Don't forget to square that. Excuse me, don't forget to cube that. And then the period is 3.15 times 10 to the 7 seconds, and you got to square that. And you do all of that math on your calculator, and you get that the mass of the sun is 2.0 times 10 to the 30 kilometers. Okay, cool how that all works out? All right, now for our third example, we're going to use Kepler's third law to determine the average distance from the sun to Mercury. That is Mercury's semi-major axis. Now, for Kepler's third law, we are going to use this form of the equa equation, which says that the semi-major axis for one planet divided by its period semi-major axis cubed for one planet divided by its, its period squared is equal to the semi-major axis of another planet cubed divided by its period squared. Okay, and that comes from Kepler's third law and Kepler's constant. Now, we are looking for Mercury, so we're going to draw a little diagram here where we have the Sun, and Mercury is, of course, the first planet from the Sun, and we need another planet, and you could use, once again, any planet in the solar system, but what the heck, let's just use Earth again like that. And we are going to say that the distance from the sun to the Earth is A1, and therefore that is 150 million kilometers again, and we know that the period is T1, and that's 365 days. In this equation, don't get confused because this is cubed, and this is squared, and this is a 1, and this is a 1. So this is the values that we're going to use for Earth, and for Mercury, we're going to call that planet number two in this case. And we have a semi-major axis for Mercury that we're trying to solve for. And we know the period of Mercury, the orbital period, is 88 days. All right, so we have four different values here. Three are known, and the fourth one, which is this one, A2, is what we're going to be solving for. So once again, we're going to cross-multiply, and we get that when we cross-multiply. And then we cross multiply this way and this way, and we want to solve for A2, and that's A2, this value right here. So once again, we're going to divide both sides of the equation by the other value, which is T1 squared. And we get that A cubed is equal to A3, A1 cubed times T2 squared divided by T1 squared. Now we've got to take the cube root of both sides. And we get that A2, which is going to be our um, distance from the sun to Mercury, is going to be equal to the cube root of those other terms, like that. So now on the next slide, we can just plug all the values in there, and we get that it's the cube root of 150 million kilometers cubed times 88 days squared. The period for uh, the Earth is 365 days. Don't forget to do your cubing and your squaring. I would like to point out that for the periods here, you could use any unit that you want. We were given days, but if you wanted to convert to years 
or to seconds or whatever. It doesn't matter because those units were canceled. And we have kilometer, kilometers here. I left it as kilometers because that means we'll get our answer out as kilometers. If we had put meters in here, we would get our answers out in meters. But most commonly, when we talk about the distance from the sun to the planets, we get we talk about those in kilometers. So when you do that on your calculator, you get 5.8 times 10 to the 7 kilometers, which is equal to 58 million kilometers. And that is indeed equal to the center major axis, the average distance from Mercury to the sun. Okay, so that is example number three. Let's see what we got for number four. Number four says calculate Kepler's constant for our solar system. So this is the equation we use to calculate Kepler's constant. Kepler's constant, constant Kepler, is equal to a cubed, the length of the center major axis cubed, divided by the period squared, and this is the information that we're going to use. We're going to calculate Kepler's constant in astronomical units and days. This is similar to the data that Kepler was using. So it's interesting to see. And we can do that for a couple different uh, planets, and we should get the same answer. So the Kepler's constant within our solar system will be the same for every planet. So let's calculate Kepler's constant first for, uh, let's see, we have here for Venus. Okay, we have the center major axis is 0 0.723 astronomical units cubed. The period is 224.7 days squared. So this is the data for Venus. And we get that Kepler's constant for astronomical units and days is 7.4 times 10 to the minus 6. Astronomical units cubed divided by days squared. Now we can check that or just see we should get the same value if we do that for another planet. Okay, in this place, we're doing that for Uranus, where we get 19.19 .19 astronomical units cubed divided by the number of days, which is 30,687 days squared. And once again, you'll see that you get the same value or very close to the same value for Kepler's constant. And you could do that for any of the planets in our solar system, and you will get that same answer 7.50 times 10 to the minus 6 astronomical units cubed divided by day squared. Okay? All right, let's go on to example number 5, which concerns Saturn and its moons. Now, you can see that we have been given some information for Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, and for Hyperion, one of the other moons of Saturn. We know that the semi-major axis for Titan is 1.22 times 10 to the 6 kilometers, and it has an orbital period of 15.95 days. Hyperion okay, has a semi-major axis of 1.48 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. We're not given the orbital period of Hyperion because, of course, that's what we're going to figure out in Part B. But in Part A, we're going to figure out what is Kepler's constant for Saturn and its moons. Now, this is the equation that we're going to use to calculate Kepler's constant. It says that Kepler's constant is equal to the center major axis cubed divided by the period squared. Now, we could use any information for any of Saturn's moons, and we'll always get the same Kepler's constant. We have been given the information for Titan, so we're going to use the information for Titan, of course. So, for Titan, we're going to use the center major axis. Now, I'm going to convert this into meters and seconds. So, it's 1.22 times 10 to the 6 kilometers, which is 1.22 times 10 to the 9 meters. you got to cube that. And the period, which is 15.95 days, we are going to convert that into seconds. And you get 1.38 times 10 to the 6 seconds. Don't forget to square that. And you get that Kepler's constant for Saturn and its moons is 9.54 times 10 to the 14 meters cubed divided by seconds squared. You'll get that same answer for any of the moons of Saturn. Now, if you do that same problem for, say, Jupiter and its moons, you'll get a different Kepler's constant, but within any orbital system, Kepler's constant will always be the same. All right, so that's Kepler's constant for Saturn and its moons, and now we're going to figure out what is the orbital period for Hyperion. Now, this is similar to the previous problem that we did, and in this case, we're going to be finding the uh, orbital period for Hyperion. T is the orbital period for Hyperion. And you can say, label the data. This is Titan's um, semi major axis, Titan's period, Hyperion's semi major axis, and we're going to solve for the P 
period of Hyperion. And we're going to use this same equation, except this time we're going to be solving for the period. These are the values for Titan, and these are the values for Hyperion. We're going to cross multiply again, and when we cross multiply, we get that, and we want to solve for the period of Hyperion, which is right here. We're going to divide both sides by the semi-major axis of Titan cubed, and we get that the period of Hyperion squared is equal to, uh, let's say we have Hyperion's semi-major axis cubed times Titan's period squared. you got to keep all this straight, divided by the semi-major axis of Titan cubed, and then we're going to take the square root of both sides, and you get that the period of Titan is equal to the square root of those terms like that. Okay, now on the next slide, we can just plug the values in. And once again, you can see I left this in kilometers because those kilometers will cancel. Normally when we talk about the period of plants, we talk about in days, so I left that in days. Of course, you could convert to seconds or whatever. And that gives you that the period of Hyperion, when you do all that on your calculator, is 21.3 days. Okay, so that's one way you can do that. Now there's another way you can come up with the same answer. And we're going to use the same data, but we're going to use Kepler's constant, which we calculated this value for Kepler's constant. And we can use this equation and just solve for t. So we're going to rearrange this equation, and we get that t squared is equal to the semi major axis cubed divided by Kepler's constant. Okay, we're looking for Hyperion, of course, the period, so we got to use the semi major axis for Hyperion. And we can plug those values in. And now in this case, the, the Kepler's constant has meters here. We have to convert into meters. You've got to remember you have to have the same units in all of your equations, okay, or in any one of your equations. You have to have the same units for all of your terms. So here we have meters, and once again, this is 1.48 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. This is 1.48 times 10 to the 9 meters. You've got to cube that, don't forget. You just divide that, take the square root, and you get the same answer um, except that it comes out in seconds here, okay, because Kepler's constant is in seconds. So now we have to convert into days, and we get 21.3 days. Okay, so that's a couple different ways you can do that problem. Okay, now for our last example, number six says that Jupiter, which is the largest planet in the solar system, it has at, this, at the making of this video 79 different moons, and Ganymede is the largest. Ganymede's average distance from Jupiter is 1.07 times 10 to the 6 kilometers, and it has an orbital period of 17.15 Earth days, and we want to know what is the mass of Jupiter. So this is another equation where we are going to find the mass, and this is the equation we're going to use just like we did previously when we found the mass of the Sun. Now we have the mass of Jupiter here. We can use Kepler's constant, okay? And we're going to find Kepler's constant first, so we're going to do this a little differently. We're going to get Kepler's constant, and we're going to get it in meters and seconds, okay? We're going to convert our semi-major axis into meters and our period into seconds, and we get that the, that the Kepler's constant in meters and seconds for Jupiter is 3.21 times 10 to the 15 meter cubed second squared. And we can plug that value into our equation, because this is Kepler's constant here. And when we do the semi major axis cubed divided by the period squared, you get Kepler's constant. And now we're going to solve this for uh, the mass of Jupiter, which is this term right here. So we are going to um, cross multiply here and then divide by g. We cross multiply, divide by g. We get the mass of Jupiter is equal to 4 pi squared times Kepler's constant divided by g. And we can plug those values in like that. 4 pi squared Kepler's constant in meters cubed seconds. And you got to get uh, uh, that because g has meters and seconds in it also. And you come out that the mass of Jupiter is 1.90 times 10 to the 27 kilograms. Okay, there you go. That was six very interesting examples for Kepler's third law. I hope you found the video helpful. If you did, please do all of the following five things. Let's see, you should subscribe to my channel. Don't miss any of my amazing content. Click on the notifications bell. You should give me a thumbs up. Leave me a nice comment, a nice positive comment in the comment section below. And don't forget to share this video. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you in the next video.
video.